Well, the first time Jesus went into Jerusalem as king, he went uh, meek and lowly and on an ass. And the second time he goes there, he'll be riding a white horse and he will be coming in to rule and to reign. Boy, I'm glad he did the first entry first. I'm glad I get to be there for the second one. But boy, I wouldn't have been there on the second if it were not for the first. Praise the Lord for the triumph of the resurrection. It's a wonderful thing to be born again and know Jesus Christ, isn't it? Amen. Please open this evening to Hebrews in your Bibles in chapter chapter uh, 8. Yes, we will be at this evening in the beginning. And I, ju- I want to focus on uh, a theme that, of course, is interwoven through this portion of Hebrews where we're seeing that Jesus is better than the Levitical priesthood system or than the law uh, which he fulfilled and which he replaced. And, uh, of course, we know in the, in the letter to the Hebrews, this is a series of arguments by the Spirit of God, by the Holy Spirit, helping believers to be persuaded not to go back into the religion that they came from. Because if they go back into that religion, if it were valid in every way, Jesus is better than everything in the religion. And we'll look at those ways briefly by way of review. Uh, but we'll begin in verse 23 of chapter 9 this evening. And we'll just read verse 23, and then we'll ask the Lord's help tonight. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Now let's read that again and let's try to emphasize uh, the last part of the phrase in a way that helps understanding. Okay? It was, well, let's read verse 22 with it. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So, Father, please help us this evening as we look at the better sacrifice in a better place that all of the things in the law symbolized and yet were only shadows or pictures of. And as we see these pictures this evening, help us to admire our Savior Jesus and to forsake anything that would be merely a picture of the real thing, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's necessary for us within context, of course, oftentimes especially, in order to keep from misinterpreting the letter to the Hebrews. Uh, A lot of people want to argue systematic or systems of theology in passages of Hebrews, which it really has nothing to do with. Hebrews is not a letter written, take this for a theme statement if you will, Hebrews is not a letter written to debate Arminianism and Calvinism. Unfortunately, most commentaries on Hebrews debate Calvinism and uh, Arminianism. Either elect according to the will of God salvation or free will of man where God is helpless in it, salvation. And that has nothing to do with Hebrews. And if you interpret the passages in Hebrews to support your system of theology, not only will you uh, be wrong in how you interpret it, but you'll miss the whole point of Hebrews. Hebrews is a letter written to suffering, persecuted Hebrew believers who because of hardship and discouragement and difficulty have gone back in their faith and have left growing spiritually, have left moving forward and fellowshipping with the saints, and rather instead they have gone back into their old religion. They've gone back into Judaism. And the letter is written giving reasons, first why it's not a good idea, and warnings about what will happen as a result of it. And the, those are uh, two of the attitudes that the Holy Spirit gives when He uh, reasons with the Hebrew Christians. First of all, here's a good reason why this is a flawed way of thinking. But then, here's what's going to happen if you do that. And uh, it is, again, an example of what we see in Jude 
where the Holy Spirit uses Jude to tell the believers, and if some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear. And so if one doesn't get you, then the other should. Sometimes, you know, I said, you know, sometimes different people have different personalities. Some folks you can reason with, and some people you just got to scare good. And, uh, you know, the fact is, though, we all have a little of both of those personalities, depending on which extreme balance we have, and maybe we're half and half. Sometimes just give me a good reason for something, and sometimes just frighten me enough. And that's what it, what it takes. Well, the reality of it, though, is that the Holy Spirit emphasizes first this truth. Judaism is not the means to God anymore. Jesus is the means to God. And so we begin by seeing, if you go back into Judaism, of course you go back into the veneration of angels and revering angels and people. And... Uh, we see from the Scripture that God never said to the angels, Sit thou here until I make thine enemies thy footstool. He said it to the Son. Uh, God never made the angels, or made His Son a ministering servant. Jesus came as a servant of men. The angels are ministering servants, but Jesus is a Son. And so, if we who are lower than the angels go back into a religion which venerates and worships an angels, we are worshiping beings which are lower than Jesus. And then the kicker of that argument, of course, was, not just the warning, but the kicker of it, was that Jesus has made us brethren. He's called us brethren. And so if we are brethren of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we worship angels, we are then, pay attention to this, if we worship angels and we're Christ's brethren, we are worshiping a lower being than ourselves. Because Jesus has made us higher than the angels. It makes no sense for a higher being to worship a lesser being. That's only done in paganism out of rebellion against God. Yeah, Romans 1 describes that, doesn't it? It talks about as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. God gave them over to reprobate mind. And what do they do? They worshipped lesser things. They worshipped beasts and four-footed creatures and creeping things. And that's what you would be doing if you go back into Judaism because you're worshiping angels and Jesus is higher than the angels. So you're worshiping something less than Jesus. And you're worshiping angels and Jesus has made us higher than the angels. So you're worshiping something less than ourselves. And that's not good, that's not good thinking, is it? Well, then there's the warning with it. God's judgment against the angels was held steadfast. When the angels followed Lucifer <coughs> in rebelling against God out of heaven, God didn't... God didn't say, well, I'm going to give you this much time and then if you repent, you can come back. No, God's wrath toward the angels was final. And there's no repenting for the angels. And so if you want to follow angels, follow that line of thought, would you please? If you think that God is going to say, well, I can understand why you worshipped angels instead of my son. Follow the thought there. If God wasn't merciful to rebellious angels, what's God going to do with your rebellious attitude when you go back into a false religion after Jesus has died for you? That's a stern warning. So you see the two examples. The one is kind, uh, reasonable, and the other one is you better look out. Which appeals to you? Which do you need? Well, if reason is, well, what am I doing worshiping angels when I should worship Jesus? What am I doing worshiping angels when Jesus made me higher than the angels? Well, if that appeals to you, that's good. But if it doesn't appeal to you, then just get, then just get frightened because God is going to judge your wickedness. He's not a God that plays around when it comes to judgment. And so that frightens me a good bit. I don't know about you, but many is the time when I've trembled as I've read Hebrews. The five warning passages in Hebrews, every single one of them have gotten goosebumps on my arms and a little bit of a shake out of me and thinking, you know what, I better not go back from following Jesus. Because first of all, I'd be wrong, but second of all, I don't want, I don't want a God whose attitude toward me when I was ungodly is to send His Son. I don't want God to respond to me in kind to my rejecting His Son. Friend, it's not going to be pretty at the day of judgment when every individual who is 
brought up before God answers for rejecting the blood of Jesus Christ. That's serious and it's sobering and ought to be so. And so, for, not, don't even mention, we don't even need to mention the testimony of believers. How are you going to reach somebody uh, without a testimony? How are you going to reach someone? <clears throat> oh, you know what? You know, the truth is Jesus. That's why I'm here <clears throat> in the synagogue worshiping angels. Jesus is the only true God. He's the only one we should worship. That's why I'm worshiping here instead. No, God cares about these things. It's a big deal. And we ought to be we ought to be in tune with God. The second one was, of course, that Jesus is superior or Jesus is greater than Moses. You know, if you go back into Judaism, you're going to go back to emphasizing the law and the keeping of the law. Is it not so that the false religion of Judaism today emphasizes laws, reasons, rules, all the writings? Have you taken time to read any of the writings of the rabbis? What do they write about? <laughs> laws. They just write about laws and laws and laws. Here's some wonderful things about this law and its benefits. By the way, as a Christian, watch out for, for falling into that trap. Sometimes we like to study the law from that perspective. But the perspective of the law wasn't so that we could understand how to keep clean and you know these are the best dietary habits and these are the benefits of these things and this is what you'll experience if you, if you keep this law. The entire point of the law was that as a schoolmaster to show us that we're dead and we are dead to uh, Christ because of our sin and that we need Jesus. The law's purpose is not to help us. Now, I know believers that play with Seventh-day Adventist type theology with regard to diet and so forth and talk about, you know, pork's really, really bad for you. Well, anything's bad for you uh, to some degree if it's had an imbalance and some things are just not good. But the Bible says that every creature of God is good. It's clean if it be received with thanksgiving. And the truth of the matter is that anything can be bad for anybody depending on their physical makeup. It isn't the law and it that it isn't something's being good or bad for you that's important. It's about something being clean or unclean. And the point of it all is to show us that we can't keep the law. So any person trying to keep the law to see the benefit of keeping the law doesn't understand the entire point of the law, and that's to show us that we can't keep the law, so we need Jesus. And so you'd go back into that if you went back into Judaism. You go back into Judaism, you go back to Moses. And the Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews says that <coughs> Moses was faithful in his house. But the story there was that Moses was a servant in the house. Jesus is the son in the house. And there's a big difference between the servant and the son. We use the illustration of getting a tour of a place by a caretaker versus getting a tour of the place by a family member. It's a big difference. You know, a caretaker probably has certain places normally that they don't go. There are certain things that they can't do. A family member has full access. And not only that, but a caretaker uh, can be replaced. A son can't be replaced. And so Moses was a servant. And then they were reminded about their attitude toward Moses anyway. Oh, you'd rather try and pretend that you can do good works and keep the law instead of receiving the uh, perfect life of Jesus. Well, let's remind you about the children of Israel and, and Moses. How popular was Moses? Ultimately, Moses didn't even enter into rest because uh, the children of Israel didn't enter into rest either. And that's how successful the whole law thing was for them. Is that what you want to go back into? There remaineth therefore a rest to the children of God. You see. And so you want to enter into rest? See, ultimately, following Moses, you, even if you could do it, Remember, first of all, that the people who could have done it didn't. It's really hypocritically, actually, isn't it? Remember what Jesus, when they said, we have, you know, we're of our father Abraham. What did Jesus say? You're of your father the devil. Abraham believed him. You don't. You know, you've, you've never venerated. You've killed and persecuted the prophets. Oh, the prophets, the prophets, the prophets. You've never listened to the prophets. It's a hypocrisy. <coughs> then Jesus is superior to the high priest. Jesus 
and, and uh, under the law, a uh, priest is qualified by being of the tribe of Levi. And he's qualified by the things that he has to do, but he always has to offer when he offers sacrifice. Sacrifice for himself first, for his own sin, and then offer sacrifice for the children of Israel. And he's never finished with that whole thing. He's a shadow. He's a picture of Jesus Christ, the high priest. But Jesus is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek, remember, was that king of Salem that Abraham paid tithes to. If Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, the argument in the scripture is, and of course Levi would have been in his loins, would have been a descendant of him, then the obvious implication is that Melchizedek was a superior priest to Abraham, and Jesus Christ is a priest after the order of Melchizedek, not to mention the prophecy in the scripture about Christ and his priesthood. So if you go back into Judaism, you're going to need, you're going to have to find, and you can't even today, may I remind you, but you're going to have to find a high priest who needs to offer sins for himself, a high priest who is a priest because of whom he descended from, but Jesus is a high priest because of an oath that God made, because he was a priest after an oath, and it's a lot bigger deal than just, well, I happen to be born this way. No, Jesus was the son, and he was that priest after the order of Melchizedek, a superior high priest. Last week, uh, we touched then on some things, some truths in chapter 8, and we looked at the sum of some of the things, and now we're in a portion of the Scripture, uh, and let's read verse 1 of chapter 8, kind of bring ourselves back into this, this context. Chapter 8 really begins to talk about or deals with the matter of the new covenant. If you go back, into Judaism, you go back into an old covenant that God said is expired. Read Jeremiah 31, 31 and forward. And a, a, a new covenant is what we have now, which is superior to the old covenant, and it's better in every way. But verse 1 of chapter 8, now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. So here is kind of a summary. We have such an high priest who is set on the right, right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. In the wilderness, when they pitched the tabernacle, who did so? Well, certain people, Levites, pitched the tabernacle in the center of the camp. The difference between that tabernacle and the, quote, true tabernacle is the one was a picture of the real one, but the one was a man-made one, and the real one God made. There's a big difference, isn't there? I, for one, have been greatly helped by not only uh, depictions of the tabernacle, but depictions of the temple. And it's really helpful to kind of see uh, the picture of holiness that the temple symbolizes. You know, you have on the outside, you have the court of the Gentiles, and then you have the court where only the women and children, where the women and children can have access and the court where only men can access, then court where the priests can access, and then the place where the Holy of Holies where no one can ex access except for the high priest once a year. It shows the almost like layers of an onion of the holy character and nature of God and the access to God. And so that tabernacle, which would have been similar to the temple in those same ways, was one that was pitched with men's hands and that men took very seriously the responsibility of pitching, but that ultimately was only a picture of the true tabernacle in heaven. So go back, if you would, to a temporary tabernacle that man made and try and compare it with the tabernacle God has made. Can anyone compare such a thing? <clears throat> it's ridiculous to do so. I appreciate artificial intelligence, but doesn't it crack you up when people try to make something that imitates what God has made, even with regard to the human body? You ever see, you know, they, I don't even know if they're real or not, but sometimes they're trying to make these uh, androids and showing pictures of an interactive artificial intelligence uh, robot and so forth. And, you know, just the gestures and the movements are, you know, they're trying to be, depict movements of a human. Uh, but they can't do it. There's a, a, a team of sled dogs pulling a 
a bird in that have imitated the movements of dogs. And it's pretty cool that they can imitate the movements of dogs mechanically. But can a mechanical dog do anything like a dog that God made? Not even close. Nothing close to it. The complexities in every way of, of what God has created versus what man imitates is nothing close. And now God told man how to, how to build the tabernacle. But it was all that man could do. When God built the tabernacle, it was obviously something man could never do. And so, again, we see that substitution. But what we're in right now is a picture period where we see things that are illustrations or in the phrase we see in our text in, the, in these several chapters, really chapters 8 through chapter 10, what we see is that the things in the law in Judaism, not the Judaism of today, by the way. The Judaism of today doesn't resemble anything like the law that God established for the children of Israel in His first covenant with them. Can we agree on that? Uh, st sometime go into a synagogue and try to figure out what people are even doing. And you'll be like, well, I don't, never saw any of this in, when I read the Old Testament. And the reason for it is because they're not interested in what God gave. They've made their own Judaism. See, because they, if they were to try to do it God's way, they'd have to deal with the reality that there's no Levitical priest, priesthood. There's no Ark of the Covenant. There's no altar. There are no sacrifices that are being made yearly. There's no dealing or accounting for sin at all. And so it's a false, fake religion. It doesn't even correctly symbolize the truth. It doesn't just show the things, okay? So... Uh, many times we have things that are symbolic, don't we? I have it in here somewhere. I've pulled this out a few times. I'm sure you all have seen my tattered picture of my wife in my um, yeah, my wallet. Here's a picture of Melissa. Melissa, what do they do to your hair? This is like 90s hair, isn't it? Okay, so here's Melissa with 90s hair. And uh, this is, if I were to pull this out where somewhere where my wife is and say, this is my wife, You'd understand what I mean, right? Now, you'd think I was kooky, kooky or crazy if I told you I don't need my wife anymore because I've got a picture. See what I mean? Now, some folks would have more peace in their home if they only had a picture of their wives, but not me. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> the truth of the matter is, is that this is great when my wife's not around, just say, oh, that's what she looks like. Right? In the 90s. <laughs> Hope you don't mind my being a little bit silly. But a picture is not anything like the real thing, trust me. Is it? And that is what we're seeing in this portion of the Scripture. Yeah, you know what? The tabernacle's a picture of the tabernacle in heaven. Yeah, the priesthood is a picture of Jesus, our high priest. Yeah, these things, the law symbolizes. These things all symbolize these things, but they're not anything like the real thing, in spite of what they are. Okay, so let's just look at some of those pictures or symbols deceiving. Some words that we see, and if you're studying, that you could, you could perhaps highlight some words that talk about picture or shadow, pattern, and, uh-oh, uh -oh. I better look at my Bible or I'm, gonna, I'm not going to remember the third. See what happens when you have poor memory. Um, uh, da, 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 shadow, picture, and let me find... Oh, pattern. Did I say pattern? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so shadow and pattern. Well, let's look at some of them, shall we? Let's go back and look at... Um, <clears throat> let's look at chapter 9 and verse 9. Is one. Oh, figure, that's the one I was looking for. Okay, figure. Um, and to, to read verse 9, you really have to read down to, to it from, from um, verse 1. Then verily the first covenant I had also ordinances of divine service. Ordinance is a law or commandment or rule. So the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service in a worldly sanctuary. There's a tabernacle made. The first, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, 
which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant, covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. And over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. Now, pardon me for not having time to comment on everything that we're looking at, but do you see the inferiority of the first <coughs> tabernacle here? You have a high priest who, going into the holiest of holies place of that shadow tabernacle, couldn't even go in there without an offering of blood for himself. In verse 8, the Holy Ghost this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as yet the first tabernacle was standing. And so the first tabernacle also clouded the second tabernacle, kept you from seeing the clear picture of the completed work of the cross. Now this is not ultra-dispensationalism that the Holy Spirit is teaching here. He's not saying that salvation before was not by faith, it was by keeping the law. No one ever kept the law. Hebrews 11 deals resoundingly with the truth that salvation has always been by faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so everyone who's ever come to God has come to God by faith. But faith in a picture, not faith in the completed object that you can see with your eyes and feel with your hands and have full access to. Friend, never lose the thrill. Never lose uh, the, the reality of what a privilege it is that you and I can go right into the throne room of God. We don't need to send Moses or Aaron or a high priest in to speak to God for us. We can go right there ourselves because of our high priest Jesus. And never let it, uh, never let it be a small thing to you that you'll be able to access the Lord Jesus Himself. That the Holy Spirit of God actually is Christ living in us. They didn't have that. Amen. There's nothing like that. It, does, it cannot compare. And it's really actually blasphemous for an individual to have the notion that this is as good as the real thing. It's not as good as the real thing. It is a cloudy picture of the real thing. And that's all. In verse 9 we see our, our phrase, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. So it was a figure, but it was a figure that could not make the person perfect. By The word perfect here, by the way, is the use of the word in the sense of uh, final or completed. Because we see, we can see later on in chapter 10, that it did make the offer perfect, but it wasn't finished. He had to be made perfect again. You could have forgiveness for sins, but you'd sin again. But here, when Jesus Christ died on the cross for us, my friend, the way God looks at us, it's done for life. It's finished forever. You say, Pastor, what happens if I physically sin? It has nothing to do with the completion of the work, the validation of the work has to do with fellowship. And you can have forgiveness for sin if you're a believer, but your ultimate forgiveness for sin is not because God forgives it. It's because it's paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. There's no more sacrifice for sin. It's a once for all sacrifice. Amen. Versus a once a year sacrifice or once every time I sin. In verse 11, the Bible says, But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, notice this, but by His own blood He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained, what's that next word? Eternal, Eternal redemption for us. Now stop here for a moment. The priest had to take blood in. But it wasn't his blood. 
It was blood of an innocent bull or goat or lamb. And he had to offer it for himself just to get there. And then he had to offer it for others just to symbolize the real thing. But Jesus went into the throne room of God with His own blood. Took His own blood in. Said, God, here's the blood I shed. Here it is. And He sprinkled that on the mercy seat. And God said, that's the best blood there is. That's the only blood that's sinless there ever was. And that's the only blood that will forever satisfy my wrath. is sinless blood sacrifice. Redemption. What's that next word? Eternal what? Redemption. Eternal redemption. Eternal redemption. That's the kind of blood Jesus offered. The kind that says it's finished. It's done. Sin is defeated. Once for all. See, before, sin was sin was atoned for. For now. At this stage, sin is paid for forever. And so the picture was a good picture because it illustrated the real thing. But the real thing, my friend, is the only valid way that a person can actually have forgiveness of sin. All that a priest offered before was symbolic of what Jesus would actually do. All that was offered before, notice, was a figure. Not the real thing. It's easy for me to visualize this. You probably perhaps cannot. Although if you could take a picture sometime and just put it out of focus, then maybe you could, you know what I'm talking about a little bit. Uh, it would be good this evening if we had the old school projector up and we were just to take it out of focus. Because if I were to take a picture of everybody in this room and put it out of focus, I could take a laser pointer and point to the out of focus people on the wall, and you could tell me who the people probably are, couldn't you? Or in other words, the figure is enough to tell. I know this because I'm minus 700 in both eyes. And when I don't have contacts or glasses in, that's all I see are figures. I am surprised that with all the pranks and things I've pulled on people, that no one has ever pulled a figure prank on me. You know, I have somebody imitate someone I know when I don't have my glasses in and uh, just play a prank on me or something. With, you know, you put your glasses on, well, that's not who I thought you were. You know, one of those sort of things would be easy to do because I'm just blind. And, and, but I can tell figures. I could, if I didn't have my glasses on this evening, I would have to quote Scripture. I could not read Scripture but I could probably wing it a little bit, uh, and I could think I knew who you were and probably be right about it. But until I get the focus in, until I get a full view, it's only what I think, not what I know. And now that Jesus Christ has offered His own blood, it's not a figure, it's the real thing. And it's in full view. So figure versus the focused actual thing. Let's look at another one. In verse 23, uh, actually, to look at it, let's look at, at uh, yeah, let's look at verse 20. No, nope, verse 19. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. I don't know about you, but in this portion, I'm actually happy that I'm not part of this ritual. I don't know what you, how you'd enjoy having a beast slain and then having hyssop mixed in some water and blood and then sprinkle it on you. Would you like to come to service this evening where that's what we were doing? Was splashing blood on you. The picture is a good picture because it helps us to see that the life of the flesh is in the blood and so there needs or must of necessity be death for atonement of sins. And I'd certainly go through that, wouldn't you? For forgiveness. If that's what God said you have to do in order to be forgiven, would you do it? I certainly would, but it's not pretty, folks. It's not a pretty picture. 
Nor is it a pretty picture to think of standing at the cross where the blood of an innocent lamb, the only innocent lamb, was shed. But Moses sprinkled the blood of bulls and goats, but Jesus sprinkled his own blood. Verse 21, Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Okay, so you see it? It was necessary that the pattern of a tabernacle in heaven, that is, the man-made tabernacle, which is a picture of the actual tabernacle, well, it was necessary that it be sprinkled with blood. But you're going to take the blood of bulls and goats to heaven and sprinkle that one? Well, that's a better tabernacle and it's got to be sprinkled with better blood. It's an understatement, isn't it? And I think the Holy Spirit here understates purposefully to help us just to see the contra contrasting uh, inferiority between the blood of bulls and goats and the blood of the Lamb of God. Jesus, His perfect Son. Verse 24, For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself. Ooh. Now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that He should offer Himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others, for then He must often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath He appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of Himself once offered versus yearly offered. Literally, from the first time man sinned, and it's been uh, nearly 7,000 years, there have been nearly 7,000 years of temporary shedding of blood. Generation after generation would have to have shed blood. I should say 7,000, but it's inaccurate because it's been 2,000 years since the Lord Jesus. And so since then, we haven't had to every single year. And I think it's kind of neat, don't you? This Passover, just to think about the fact that we're not going to offer a sacrifice this year again. Because Jesus offered the once for all, and it never needs to be offered again. Do you see the salvific implication here, my friend? How often does Jesus need to save you? How often can you be saved? Once. And that's it. And that's all that's needed because that is the picture. Oh, the law, man, it's imperfect in the tabernacle that it, that it embodies is only a picture. But the blood is the actual blood. See, everything we're seeing is pictures, but the real picture is figure blood versus real blood. And there's a great difference, isn't there? Okay? And then in verse 27, as is it appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for Him shall He appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Now verse 27 and the beginning of verse 28 are some of the most helpful truths about eternal assurance of salvation. Or I could mix up the words and say, assurance of eternal salvation. Do you see that? As is appointed unto men once to die. How many times could you die for your sin? Huh? Once. You can only die once. You only have one life to give. You can only die once for your sin. You know, you're right, Sheba. You, you, you're going to die zero times for your sin because Jesus died for your sin once. But how many times... Does Jesus need to die for someone who needs to die once? One time. That's why you can't offer another sacrifice for sin. What, you got to have another life? for You don't have a second life. You only have one. And Jesus only needed to die once. Because there's only once to die for. When Jesus died for your sin, my friend, He died for your entire life. His entire life was for your entire life. There's nothing after that to die for. Say, Pastor, what about when a believer sins? Well, that's a different matter. That's an additional matter, but the once that Jesus dies covers it 
once. And it's done. It's finished. And Jesus is able to do so because He was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for Him shall He appear the second time without sin unto salvation. There's not a, When you see Jesus the second time, you're not going to be facing death. You already have life. His life. He's alive and you're alive. If ye then be risen with Christ, Colossians 2, 3, 2. Seek that, or seek, oh, I'm sorry, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. <clears throat> where Christ sitteth on the right hand of the throne of God. Hey, listen, if Jesus is risen, so are you. And if you're risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. That's the implication for that. Verse 1 of chapter 10 is our final verse this evening that we can get to. For the law having a, what's that next word? Shadow. Shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. So the question, when could the law and the sacrifices required by the law make the people that kept the law in that way continually perfect? Never. Never. It was a shadow of things to come, and it was inferior to the actual picture, which is Jesus Christ, or to the actual figure which it depicted, which is Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is better in every way, to any sacrifice, to any law, to any rule, to any reason. So no person who would say, well, I'm going back into a good law that was validated by God would have any kind of good reason because you can't go back into anything that's anything like Jesus. As I read the Leviticus, Deuteronomy, as I read that portion of the Scripture that lays out the law and the requirements for sin, my friend, the seriousness of sin there grips me. The life of the flesh is in the blood we see over and again. And I see that death is the requirement because of sin. And blood sacrifice is the requirement because of sin. And the seriousness, the gravity of it grips me. But it's nothing like the reality that the sinless Son of God sacrificed Himself for sin. That's far more gripping. And to go back to the one is ludicrous because of the evident superiority of the latter. Jesus is better than the sacrifices required by the law. So Father, help us as we wrap our minds around these events, particularly this week, to focus on the superiority of our Savior Jesus. We pray in His name. Amen. We're going to take some prayer requests this evening. Indeed, there are a lot of things that we have to pray for for one another.